We're live, everybody. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Focusing on Family session, um, Navigating uh, Distance Learning in the New Normal. My name is Jade, and I am the library's literacy lady. You've probably seen me before if you registered or participated in our 130th event. Some other familiar faces with staff here. We have Miss Ashley, Miss Valerie, and our special guest, um, Sean Shinglai, who we will all give our um, little rounds of introductions. Just some quick housekeeping thing. Oh, and we have Olivia here. Hi, Olivia, you want to raise me? That is our social work intern um, for the fall. She's going to be working with us. Um, so just a couple quick housekeeping um, reminders, which I see everybody has, has done. Thank you so much for being um, flexible with that. Just out of respect in a public virtual space while we're getting our thing going, we're having you all muted. There will be an opportunity to chat questions um, um, directly to the presenters and staff, um, and we can take those towards the end. If you have something that jumps out at you during the presentation or during our discussion, feel free to raise your hand and we can get to that burning question as, they, as it arises. Um, also, um, feel free, cameras on, cameras off. We just want to be mindful of uh, the virtual space. We will be, for the most part, looking at visual cues. So again, if we don't see a hand raise or something like that, just chat us and we will get to that. Um, um, our session is going for about an hour, but it, we will have a little bit of time towards the end if you have any specific questions for youth services, literacy, or for Sean um, or Olivia. So uh, without further ado, let's do a couple rounds of introductions. So again, my name's Jade. I host um, mostly adult program academic enrichment programs for the library, as well as doing a little bit of work with the youth and um, early childhood education. I'm really excited to have the families that are taking up this virtual space and really gathering here for us um, as a library community to see what we can do for you. Um, I am, I've been in education for, I would say, eight to 10 years, and this has been quite a time for me, and I really am excited to have this program to um, speak on behalf of literacy and just somebody who's passionate for education to see how we can bridge some of these gaps with the challenges we're having um, in the time of the pandemic. So thank you for being here. Welcome. And I can pass it over to Ms. Ashley. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Ashley um, and I am the head of the youth services department um, and I'm super excited for this program and I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, we've been trying, you know, we're always trying to, you know, do programs and services that you guys will be into um, and it's been, you know, we've all been having a tough time since March. Um, so we really just want to um, try and support the community and work with the community um, as, much, as much as we can. So um, excited for this program. Um, and Miss Valerie is right next to me and she's another children's librarian in the department. Um, Miss Val, do you wanna say a few words? <laughs> Just wanted to say hello, um, I'm Valerie and I'm a children's librarian here at Hoboken Public Library. I'm really excited for this program um, and to get to speak with all of you today. Awesome. Um, and I actually know Sean through um, the Hoboken Early Childhood Advocacy Council or Committee, um, HICAC. Um, and so, you know, I met Sean through that and I'm so glad um, that, you know, we could like make this work and get a program going together. So very cool. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, before we um, get Sean to do a little bit of his intro, uh, Olivia, if you don't mind just introducing yourself quickly, saying a few words and your work with us here at the library at this time. Sure, yeah. Um, my name is Olivia. I think there's another Olivia here also. Um, so I am the social work intern with the library. Um, I'm a student at NYU and the Hoboken Library has been gracious enough to allow me to intern with them. Um, one of my, one thing that I do at the library is I co-facilitate one of the workshops, the Writing for Wellness workshop with um, Jade. And we're having the last few sessions coming up. If anyone wants to join us, it's a great time. And very happy that I was invited to be part of this program today. Thanks, Olivia. 
And um, last but certainly not least, um, I'd like to introduce our um, guest of the evening, Mr. Sean Shinglai. Um, he has been um, doing work again with the library previously with um, other work with these services, but specifically tonight, I would like to um, welcome Sean once more with work with us and um, excuse me, also point out a lot of the accomplishments that he has done. Sean is a licensed clinical social worker um, practicing both in New York and New Jersey. Um, he works as a school social worker um, for the New York um, Department of Ed and the Division of Early Childhood Education. Um, he also has a private practice where he sees individuals, couples, and families um, for psychotherapy. Uh, he's currently studying in a doctoral program uh, to become a school and clinical psychologist. Um, he's also a father of three young boys, and he's also trying to find his own balance between supporting um, the new normal of learning and his own work. So, Sean, thank you for being here, um, and if you'd like to take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so, why don't we get started. Let me make sure, uh, just make sure everybody can see this. All right, so uh, thank you for having me. Again, my name is Sean. Uh, I'm the uh, School of Social Workers. Uh, I spend a lot of time in visiting schools and talking to teachers and talking to principals. And you know, it's just a great honor for me to be here, uh, sharing some of the uh, fun information. I know we all have a very tough time right now, so uh, thank you for you know Jade, Ashley, and everybody inviting me for uh, doing a quick little workshop about uh, you know how can we support our children in the you know in the remote settings or you know the new normal. Uh, so. Uh, before we start, I uh, just want to take a moment to really talk about the, you know, recognizing the elephant in the room here, you know, uh, there's a lot that's going on, uh, you know, this is for almost all of us, uh, this is one of the craziest school year ever, uh, ranging from back to school to now in school, and now we have another period we have to figure out, uh, are we putting the kids back to a full time or remote or blended and 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 it's just crazy uh, and very hectic for everybody. So I want to uh, make a note of that. Uh, and I also want to make a note of how you know the the remote learning, the distance learning, or whatever the the, the terminology we use, uh, it has been very stressful. Right? It had it's new to everybody. It's been very stressful, and uh, quite frankly, that. It's not very uh, parent friendly. Right? It's not something that it was easy to do, uh, and, and quite frankly, that a lot of times uh, there's a lot of changes uh, in the last minutes, and there's a lot of things that we need to learn. We need to adapt in the last minutes. Uh, I think this is also a very uh, difficult for a lot of the families with multiple siblings, uh, family with different age groups. You know, they have people in the kindergarten and then middle school and high school. So just a, there's a lot of jugglings trying to figure out who gets the iPad or who gets what time and who gets the internet, right? Or the parent gets the internet. Uh, so there's, a, there's just a lot of stress and there's a lot of logistic uh, situations ranging from childcare, from work from home for the adults, sharing the internet, the iPad, the meetings. Uh, and, and the list goes on. Uh, so uh, I also want to make two additional points here. One is that uh, you know this this workshop for tonight, uh, this afternoon, is mostly geared to a lot of the younger students uh, for the families. But I also want to make a reference that you know a lot of the information that we'll be discussing this afternoon will will be also pretty relevant for. Uh, family with the older kids, students at home, and when whenever it is uh, relevant, I will also make a note of that. I will try to point it out. And I know I also recognize that you know we're two three months into a school now, 
so some of them might feel like, uh, you know, could have known a little bit better a couple of weeks ago when the first school started it. But, uh, you know, the, the strategy, the defense I would be discussing this afternoon is still good. You know, it's still important and it's not too late to set it up for some of the things that we can talk about. So even though the school has started it, a lot of things that we've been talking about this afternoon would be uh, still pretty relevant. All right, so all of that challenges and everything, it is very important to know that it's okay. You know, uh, it's very important for, for us to remind ourselves that, you know, it's okay and, and, and let's take a deep breath. Uh, you know, the, the kids, are very good. They're wired to learn in all kinds of difficult settings, different possible settings, any possible ways. And you know, they're 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 so good at it. Uh, the key really is for us to learn how can we promote uh, the environment. How can we help them to really maximize their learning and really optimize the setting, so that you know, in this very difficult times. Uh, they still get the chance to to learn as much they, as they can, right? Uh, you know, so I know that speaking from my own experience, sometimes it's, it's very challenging. Sometimes I have to use the internet, I have to use the tablet. So so it's okay, you know. Sometimes that the kids will have to miss here and there. Uh, it's okay, uh, you know. We need to give ourselves a little break on this. And, and lastly, the most important thing here is to really try to have a positive attitude especially during this pandemic, you know, it's, it's a very stressful time for everybody. Uh, and it is crucial for us to try to stay positive as much as we can. And you will see it is a theme throughout the rest of the, um, the workshop. So let's start from the beginning, right? So how do we set up a kind of a learning at home? You can see, you know, uh, what is a what is a good setup for the kids? You know, what is a good setup at home? And here, I think the important thing is to understand that we have everything we need at home already to help them to succeed. You know, uh, simple stuff, kitchen stuff, clothes, fabric, all kinds of stuff is already readily available for us. Uh, so it's about how do we utilize them. And it is important for us to help our kids to really explore, you know, explore in places where they are already, already comfortable, right? This will help with the learning process, you know? Uh, the key here is you don't have to create classrooms in your home and outside, you know, the students, younger kids really learn uh, best when they feel very familiar with the surrounding, uh, when they're safe, right? And and to you know to really explore the world, you know. I sometimes or uh, rather I would say most of the times, right? Exploring is uh, is very messy, right? <laughs> As I can speak from my own experience. Uh, but but if you think about it, to, in the in, in the kids' perspective, you know that's a lot of fun. That's a little different things. You know the the limitation is goes far and wide as, as, as far as our, you know, we as a parent are willing to explore. So here is sort of the, the little uh, plea for the kids to say, you know, let's try to, try to let them explore, try to, try to have them do different things. As long as it's safe, as long as, you know, supervision, these are the perfect time for them to really learn different things through different ways. Um, so we talk about the overall idea. So then let's sort of talk about, you know, what can we do to really design a space for learning? Uh, so first of all, you know, the idea of trying to create a formal sort of study area, the academic school area for learning, right? This could be something simple as a, just a standard desk, right? some kind of dining table, anything really. And then, on top of that, the idea is trying to create a this nice little reading area, this comfy reading nook. And um, I would say that you can also try to use it to double as a relax, relaxing area, you know, something for them to uh, to take a break a little bit. Uh, 
So next is trying to create space, you know, so sometimes, you know, school has a lot of project, a little crafts. Uh, so this will be a good idea to give a little bit of space for the kids to be able to use it. Uh, a lot of times, you know, and realistically, a lot of times that's just the desk that they use or the dining table, right? So the goal here is to just try to create an environment, you know, as ideal as possible to an environment that you can mimic what's like in a school setting, right? The environment that you can try to help with the focus, trying to minimize the stress and just trying to nurture the learning. Uh, so what would that look like? Here is uh, one of the uh, best case scenario, right? You can see there's a little desk, there's a comfy sitting, natural lights, some kind of schedules, uh, different settings, right? So this is like a, uh, a funny take on, you know, what, what should it look like? And just to make a, a quick reference back for uh, the comfy area, uh, which I actually recommend a lot. I think this is a, a very important thing uh, to have it instead of just a couch or even, you know, I see a lot in school is uh, kids will just go back to their bed. Uh, so what I would recommend is to try to have a comfy area if you can uh, to keep it in the same place because the goal is to try to, again, like I said, to nurture that learning environment, trying to uh, keep the focus. Uh, so a lot of times that, you know, if people trying to take a break, they go to bed, they go to the, the couch or sofa, that kind of breaks that rhythm. So if you have the room, if you have the space, uh, that's something that I highly recommend. Uh, so again, this is a best case scenario. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's not always ideal. And so I, I understand the spacing situations. Uh, now, you know, once we have a designated space, uh, let's look at what we can do trying to bridge the, the learning to the classrooms, All right? So uh, here are some of the tips, right? It's trying to share photos, videos, uh, trying to share the work, the artwork, the drawing, the whatever uh, that your, your kid's doing with the teachers, right? And and whenever is and this is an important part. Whenever you are available, if you can, you know, sit with them. You know, sit with them during their live classes, during their, you know, meetings uh, as much as you can, and trying to learn what's going on and trying to engage with them. Uh, and this is especially important for the younger kids. You know, uh, and and here, I think for for the teacher is also important to to let your teachers know, right? Like what works at home. You know, what are some of the things you notice while the kids are home learning, you know, and this will really help your teachers, the teaching team to, to have a better understanding and have a, more information so then they can help to uh, assist your kids in learning as well. You know, one thing I've seen in, in school is that a lot of times, you know, given the limitation from remote learning, uh, there's very little engagement. There's a, there's a lot of just one way sort of uh, delivery of the information. So uh, I know on the teacher side, they are also looking for helps from the parents to say, hey, you know, uh, this didn't quite work. This was something that was challenging. They can use all the feedback they get in which they can then come back and try to make the class, uh, the learning a lot more enjoyable for each and every one of the kids. So that's something that uh, to keep in mind. Uh, the next one is, you know, thinking about, you know, on the topic of staying engaged, you know, and this is also important for the, the older kids as well. You know, if you have an older children's, uh, uh, older child at home, because if you think about it, this is one of the, go you know, as, as bad as the pandemic goes, this is one of the golden opportunity for us as a parent to really learn and connect within uh, in the middle school and high school to see what they're going on, to see what is on the topic. And, you know, this is a opportunity that we wouldn't have normally and give us another way to try to have a conversation and trying to be part of your life and trying to be that supportive parent. And having that remote blended learning give us that opportunity. But for the, uh, the younger kids, I think it's also cool to 
to be able to be there with them, right? Because this could be a conversation that you can extend uh, past the, the school time. You know, we, we have a couple, you know, half hour or an hour or, you know, shorter times in the school. And it, a lot of emphasis is put on the parents to continue that learning, continue that education. And this will be that wonderful bridge for you to, you know, connect what's going on from the classroom to their daily life, right? It's like, you know, what's going on? You know, what are some of the things that's exciting in the class today? What are some of the topic that's fun? And maybe you can extend, you know, so something that happens to my, my household a lot is, you know, whenever the teacher is doing something cool, a science experiment or something fun, I try to see, can we extend that, you know, in my own household and say, hey, let's try that to really, uh, you know, foster that learning and trying to build on it. So then, you know, my son will go back to the classroom next, the next day and then say, oh, you know, we, we continue to do that. And that really strengthened that the bond for the family, but also strengthening his learning. Uh, the last part here, I just wanted to, uh, to talk about, mention and briefly is, you know, this ongoing communication uh, with the schools, with the learning team, you know, a lot of people uh, might, not, you know, this might not apply to a lot of family, but for those who has some kind of IEP or d d different plans, it is even more important for you to continue to have that conversation with all kinds of pro providers. Uh, you know, in, as Jay said, I had my private practice, you know, in a lot of practice, I can tell you that in the sessions, uh, it is hard to really get the full pictures just via the, the Zoom sessions or the online meetings. So uh, I will wish, you know, I will hope that the family will be able to give me more information. And that goes the same thing for the speech, for, you know, physical therapy, all kinds of provider that the more information you can give it to them and share and communicate with them, the better it will be for them to then provide the services for your child as well. So it, it really is a very mutual, uh, goes both way. Uh, so that's something to uh, keep in mind as well. And all that is to say that it is key for us to really partner up with the child's learning team, with this teaching team, with everything. So then we can make it, uh, you know, as, as difficult as it is in, during the pandemic, but still make it a great academic year for the kids as they learn. Um, so now we set up the, the environment. Let's talk about uh, routines. Uh, so one of the things that it's, it's important for children and even adults is that, you know, we need a consistent routines. We need, you know, to, to, you know, we thrive with predictability, right? Just imagine, you know, you imagine everyone, you know, us as an adult, right? You know, how upset sometimes we get if there's some kind of last minute changes, right? There's kind of things that come, pops up um, unexpectedly at work, just, how emotional sometimes we get. It's the same thing with the child, right? So being able to anticipate uh, what is going to happen really is a key uh, that it provides them with a sense of safety. It can try to anticipate, it can try to, uh, you know, trying to relieve that anxiety. And when, when the change comes, they can also do better with the transitions. All right, so it's the same thing for us, it's the same thing for them. So here's some of the pointers, right? Here's some of the things to consider when we're trying to create routines for, for everyone. So, you know, trying to create a routine that is predictable and that works for your family. So this is a key here, right? Every family is very different. Uh, so we're not trying to go our way to make a schedule for one child. We're trying to make a schedule, a routine for the entire family. So then the entire family can try to work together. Uh, second one here is to try to, uh, trying to make something visual, you know, trying to see a, a visual schedule so then that everybody can see. Uh, this is more important, especially for the younger kids to understand uh, what's to come and talk about changes. You know, if there is a change in routine, uh, what I would say would be a good idea is trying to give them reminder, right? We, we as adults has that too, right? We set our phone to say, hey, you know, here's the reminder for something. It's the same thing for them. One or two or three or four 
reminders uh, just so then that they know the upcoming changes, especially when it's approaching. So uh, what is it like in, in more details? Some of the suggestions I'll have for the actual routine you know, so for the younger kids, obviously, you know, getting dressed every day, trying to stick to the routine as, you know, as much as you can with some flexibility. Uh, some of the things here, I put it down that are more geared toward the younger kids, right? We can talk about, you know, what, what's the goal for today? What are we expecting to do? Uh, is it one session with the teachers and, and one artwork? Uh, you know, or maybe cleaning or going out, soccer games. So those are the things that's important to, to write it down and visualize it, right? And trying to schedule a time where everybody gets to eat together for lunch, for dinner, uh, and trying to schedule and trying to balance the, the fun time, the study times, and um, trying to schedule something that is self-care. It's a break time. And that includes... That includes the adults, you know, trying to build in those times to remind ourselves that, hey, you know, we've been working all day. Uh, it is perfectly okay, it's, you know, to, to take a five minutes break. And the break can include sort of movements, it could be a physical activity, it could be anything, right? But all this is to help to create that visualization of this is what kind of, what goes on. And this helps to also help the kid to resemble some kind of classroom structure to say, you know, within these times, this is what's happening, right? There's some time for learning, there's some time for fun, there's some, some time for food, some time for, you know, napping or relaxing the break time. And then again, you know, give heads up uh, if there's something that unexpected was gonna happen, there's some kind of changes. So trying to give heads up as, as much as possible. Um, here's just a, um, you know, some of the um, example you can see, you know, preschool, kindergarten uh, schedules, you know, one to nine, just some visualize. Uh, then you can put it on the fridge for somewhere that people can see. Uh, I would make a note for children, um, you know, so the family with older kids, uh, they, you can still do this, you know, it, it can be a lot more straightforward and longer in blocks. So it's sort of been uh, more detail and concrete, it can just be like eight to 10 with class, you know, 10 to 12. So it's a longer break. But again, having that visual schedule, so routine is still going to be very helpful for everybody in the family. Um, how are we doing? Uh, so one of the things I think it's important here uh, is meaningful activity, right? So what can we do as a family in terms of helping our kids to learn. So here I have the idea of the meaningful activity and it could be anything. It could be a project that you guys decided to do. It could be outings, it could be some a weekend trip. It could be anything really. It can be volunteering, it could be cooking, going to the neighborhood. Uh, the key here is to try to collaborate with your kids. You know, what is something they like? In fact, sometimes I will make up some idea and I'll ask my kids idea, what do they like? Is, if it's something that I can do for them, I will do and the family will do it together. Um, and this has a huge implication for kids when they take the lead, when they're trying to do something and we follow through with them. It's, it's so powerful and so important in their process of learning. So what are some of the uh, meaningful activities that can look like? So here's, a, here's one of my, uh, Here's one of my favorite slides. So anything uh, here, right, is, is just to really trying to point out that just how, uh, how important in our life, how crucial it is for us to have a positive attitude in life, right? I am I'm pretty sure this happens uh, uniformly, uh, universally across every family. And we all had those moments. And, and can we try to look at it in a more uh, positive way, you know, instead of, you know, a, a kid screaming, you know, we can look at it as a, a yelling practice and, and how do we, you know, use that as a way to engage with them in a more positive way. Uh, so one of the meaningful activity I want to uh, worth mentioning is about 
uh, physical activity, right? The, there is plenty of research to show that having a good balance of physical activity and physical uh, fitness will improve their academic performance. Uh, and, you know, given the pandemic, you know, there's a lot more focus. There's, uh, we're, we're a lot more limited in terms of the physical activity we can do. A lot of people are doing the Zoom meetings, the Google Classroom. So we already spent a lot of times on the screen time. So uh, if it's possible, try to limit those screen times uh, as much as you can. You know, a, a break doesn't mean a, a break from classroom Zoom to uh, a video games or a TV time. You know, so trying to do something that's trying to uh, limit the screen time would be one of the highest priority in the physical activity sections. Uh, some of the suggestions I have is, you know, a daily walk, you know, go walk around the block or even, you know, if you're more restricted in the, in the house, you can do a yoga, try to do as a, a whole family, right? If a whole family can do some kind of activity together. And want to kind of stress the idea of a family. You know, a lot of time uh, parents will tell me like, oh, they, they, the kids will do it, but then they choose not to do it. Or they, they, when they had the moment, they would just go back to their phone. And, and one of my recommendations is always, you know, did you guys do it as a whole family? You know, this is a, another perfect time for the whole family to do it together. You know, when the kids see you also taking the time when this, the kids see you doing a yoga together with them, they also are more likely to do it. Right. And this you can turn a, a kind of like a break time into uh, a family outing, a family activity. Right. So there's a lot of things that uh, we can do here. And, and the key is can the whole family try it as much as you can try to do as a family uh, gathering event. Uh, here's just on the picture, right? you know, the different things, different step, you know, the moderate physical, uh, it's maybe it's a little hard to see it, but it's just different options. Uh, what things can you know people can do in terms of physical activity? Try to avoid again the video video games or the screens, or the phone. And what we're trying to do is ultimately we're trying to have that energy balance where you know the energy going out as the activity and then the energy coming in from the food. And right? that's a balance that we're trying to strike. Uh, Another things on top of the physical activity, another key things on the meaningful activity is to help the kids uh, through play, is learn, learning through play. Uh, so one of the key things that, and this is for definitely for the much, uh, the younger younger students, right? One of the, one of the importance for here is we, they learn through play. You know, uh, the play really helped the kids learn by providing a way to communicate different things, uh, feelings, thoughts, and experience. And it also helped them to, uh, in practice, uh, de developing new problem solving skills. It gives them opportunity to really test something different, test their idea, test their theories. And it's a great opportunity for them to build their language. Uh, so a key here to remember is when the play is happening, when the play is meaningful, the kid really learn, uh, really have that moment to process those new informations. And those back and forth between you and the kids is going to foster a lot, a lot of the good sort of development as they grow up to learn to how, how to communicate with people better, to learn how to deal with their uh, emotions and to obviously to grow their language ability. Uh, so some of the things on strategy on what that actually looked like. So for example, you know, if you speak another language at home other than English, this is a perfect time for you to use your home language to help them to grow their uh, language skills. There's enough research shows that bilingual, so right, different languages spoken at home is going to help the kids to uh, do better when it comes to language. So try to use your home language, native language as much as possible. Uh, and you can play and learn in any in sort of in any activities every day. It could be cooking, it could be doing laundry, you can do whatever. As long as there's some kind of, you know, any activity you can turn into something playful and fun for the kids, All right? Um, and 
one of the things to help them is ask open-ended question. What are you doing? You know, how, how is this happening? What can we do? Those will also be very good to facilitate changes and to, to facilitate them to engage with you. And last but not least, the idea here is, you know, you can use a lot of the modeling, right? You can, you can, you can see, hey, you know, I, I see you are, you see, I see you doing something, right? I see you stacking the box. Look, look at me stacking the boxes. So that will also give them the language on what to do. Uh, one additional note for the, uh, uh, for the kids at home is reading and math. Um, again, the research has done in, enough research to suggest that having reading skills and having basic math skills are crucial to their success in school. And I would argue that it's crucial for uh, uh, just about anything uh, in life, right? To having, having those skill sets. So those can, can start early, you know, daily readings, uh, and it doesn't matter how you how you read it. it. Could be read out loud, can be being funny, can do whatever, whatever you guys want. But the idea here is the more reading you do with the kids, it will help them to build that critical thinking skills. And for math, for that reason, it's also very important that you know the understanding of basic math is key to succeed, right? And that could be anything. That could be uh, when they. You know, in dining table, they can count how many spoons are there. Some kinds of daily event you can build in as a map. It doesn't have to be workbook. You know, those are very helpful. There can be additional uh, resources to use, but you can use any daily situations. You know, how many spoons do I have? Uh, what is the different, you know, for younger kids, different shapes in the house or check out different menus, right? So all things are, can turn into math. Right. And for older kids, there's also online classes through the Coursera or other online websites that they can continue to learn and grow their skills. Uh, how are we doing time? Good. Uh, so the last part, the big parts here is talking about their feelings, right? the social and the emotional being. So one of the things that's uh, important to know that, you know, this is a, a very, very challenging time for the kids and for the adults for that matter, right? It is uh, essential that we really consider how they're feeling during these times and to ourselves as well, right? Children and grown alike feel a range of emotions uh, and as the adults in their lives. So it is our job to first help them to uh, first, to help ourselves to recon, uh, recognize our feelings and then help them to understand their emotions, right? And it is, you know, very important for us to communicate with them that all of their feelings are valid. You know, there's no right or wrong feelings. So, uh, you know, I, I can share that, you know, I see a lot of people in the schools in my practice, there's a huge increase in the children's and family having the uh, difficulty to adjust to the new norm here, right? And I think one of the, one of the biggest factor here is uh, a lot of time, the family, including the child, right, has, you know, lacks that idea of, you know, they, they're unable to express their feelings or they lack the feeling recognitions. And a lot of time in the therapy, that's what we do, you know, just trying to teach them this, the vocabulary, the skills and that feelings. All right, so, you know, what does that look like? Here is a kind of like a, a, a picture that I really like. Uh, you see this through a different format. Sometimes it's just uh, uh, faces with the different kinds of emotion. Uh, this is the one I use a lot when I do workshops and in, in session because it, 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 it's separated into four quadrants and it's separated from the energy level and the pleasant and un unpleasant. Uh, so. It doesn't matter if you have a, a three-year-old at home or a 15 or, you know, uh, everybody can learn their emotions and feeling better. Now you can see there is, uh, uh, there's a lot of different feelings here. Uh, there's a lot of vocabularies here. There's many different ways to, to help them to learn. Something I would say, uh, my recommendation is we can, for the younger kid, we can teach, is this something that was, makes you happy or not happy? 
you know, is it something with the high energy, like, you know, is this burst out laughing or anger outburst, or is it something more on the lower energy where it could be a calm or worried, right? And we can help the kids to identify which cross are there. And that's, that's all you need for the little kids. For the older kids, then we can say, what kind of, what kind of feeling is that actually? What's that vocabulary? To so give them the vocabulary so that they can use the words correctly when they have a, a difficult time, when they can successfully to explain what's going through the, you know, the, in their experience. And that's the key because if the kids can explain what they're feeling, then it's easier for adult, you know, both the teacher and the parents to help them with what they are. If the kids only say, oh, they're, they're, they're upset, they're, they're, they're angry, that's it's a little bit more limited on what we can do, right? So the key here is trying to give them the vocabulary to trying to teach them what that experience feel like. And we can use ourselves as a model, right? We can say, you know, that experience, that event just happened, right? The, the, the way that someone just talked to me, that make me feel upset, that make me feel angry, or that make me feel sad. So we can also model our experience to a younger kids. So then they learn what that feeling feels like and then put that vocabulary with it. So they, they, they can then able to describe it themselves. Uh, just to be a little bit more uh, on the tips here, right? So it is a huge component in promoting the online learning when we do check in with the feelings and emotions. Uh, again, the open communication, the conversation with the kids, it's really important. It, it helps them to hold the space for them to talk about anything, any emotion that could be both positive, negative, uh, and in pandemic, right? It's especially important on the fears and concerns that they have. Right? And we want to give them that space that they can feel comfortable in sharing those feelings and concern with us. Uh, again, using open-ended questions, right? How are you feeling? What are you excited about? What can I do to help you, right? All those will be key to help facilitate and elicit a, a conversation going forward. And then engage, you know, engage them in, in the topic that they are really interested, right? And explain how things might look different this year, right? In this pandemic. So then they can also be prepared, not just school-wise, not just you know, anything, but they can be prepared both emotionally, physically, and socially, right? There's a lot of changes this year and they can use some, you know, little reminder as we talked about earlier. Uh, so lastly, I think, you know, we talk about how we can help everybody uh, in the family. And now this is a time to talk about how to, how can we can help ourselves, right? It is very important to, prioritize our self-care, right? And part of it because any kids in the family will be able to sense your anxiety, your frustration, and your anger. When you're having a rough day from work or from whatever, they can feel it. And they might not know what it is exactly, but they can feel the energy is a little different. You know, the, it feels a little different coming from their parents. So it's important to take care of yourself uh, so then that you can take care of other people. All right, um, so take some time. Uh, it can come in different forms, right? It, it, you know, just do whatever kind of makes you happy. It could be simple activity, uh, you know, but pay attention to both your mental and physical well being, right? So uh, this goes the same for the kids, you know, you can work with them and let them choose their own self care activity, right? And, and the, the takeaway here is, you know, by taking care of yourself, you are modeling for the children that so they seize and learn that when when the day gets tough, they they have strategy that they can do to calm themselves and take care of themselves. Not just now, but going forward, right? The more you do this, the more you're teaching them that how to deal with a rough day, and, and that's, that's a key life skills. All right, so uh, I think that. At the end of the day, right? It doesn't matter how many kids, uh, what you know, you have at home or what their age, uh, you know, what grade they're in. I think they all dependent on you, the parent, to be there to support them, right? So, the the self care is especially important to me is that 
you know, if we can take care of ourselves, then we can always be there when the kid need us to be, right? Right now, they might not, in this moment, they might not, but we all know that there's gonna be a time they're going to really look up to us and really need our support, really need our help to go through whatever they're going through. So uh, again, please take care of yourself so then we can be there when they needed us. Uh, it's just uh, pictures I like. This is, uh, you know, if you've seen the given tree, uh, you know, this is the alternative ending where the kid tell the kid, uh, to, you know, say, no, it's time we set boundary. And then the tree was happy. Uh, so it's one of my favorite slides. Uh, and, and lastly, I think the idea is um, uh, continuing the ongoing learning, right? Uh, I appreciate people are here today. I appreciate, you know, Ashley, Jane, and everybody invite me here because that's an example of continued learning. We all need to learn. We all need to try to be informed both of the pandemic or the school settings or everything, right? The more we know, the more we can help our kids, right? So there's some webinar going on. There's some local workshop from the library like this. And there are also some uh, local support group, you know, Facebook and whatever, you know, I would just extend and say, you know, try to have as much support and try to have as much learning opportunity as possible. Um, I included some of the parent stores in which I gave Jade already. Uh, there's a, a lot of the good ones, mostly from, you know, because I work in New York City, uh, mostly is New York City based. Uh, I, I should make a disclaimer that, you know, I'm not getting commission for any of those, those such as some of the uh, resources that I've gathered. Uh, you can see it from the New York City uh, DOE website for some of them and some of them are the ones that uh, my colleague also gave it to me. Um, I will highlight some of the uh, interesting thing. One is the, you know, the, the book, you know, there is a series of the book uh, by uh, Hirsch and it talks about uh, additional resources for the parents and teacher. This is more on the material that if you kind of like a supplement material for them to help them continue to uh, and it's by grades. So it's just additional resource for parents and teacher uh, um, on the materials. Um, here's some more. And then I think the, the last one that we pointed out is this uh, on the very bottom, there's a room app. And this is an app and this is a website too. Uh, you can see, and it has, this is geared for uh, younger kids, but they have a lot of different activity, both for family and teacher. And there are sorted by age, um, you know, based on the developmental stages. And they have different kinds of activity, both for verbal, for fun, and for uh, anything. Uh, so that's an app that I personally use a lot and I enjoyed it. Uh, but again, you know, uh, I trying to make it clear that, you know, I'm not getting a commission for this. So this is uh, all public information for anyone who's interested. Um, so that's it, you know, um, any questions, any things? I'm going to uh, end the slideshows. <laughs> thank you, Sean. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for um, sticking around and listening to Sean's wonderful presentation. I hope you gathered some really helpful um, tips and takeaways to help you navigate this challenging time with your family and your little. And um, as Sean mentioned, even though, you know, a lot of this was geared towards some of our younger learners, it's still applicable to multiple learner families. And all the resources that Sean has shared towards the end, you will all get a copy of those resources as well as some that the library will shout out. And um, um, also with Sean's permission, a, uh, um, a nice condensed version of his presentation. So for all of you who have registered, thank you. You will get all of that. Um, we would like to open this um, time right now for questions. Um, oh, I have a question here. And yes, again, I know, um, just part of housekeeping, I had all of us muted until this time. So we'll be able to um, start a little bit of a discussion. I do have a question from Katie, um, which I'll allow her to go ahead. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, 
Yeah, thanks, Katie. I see you're you're writing it in a, in our in our chat to everyone. I'll I'll go ahead and let you. Um... Hi, Katie. Are you there? Oh, hi. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I didn't try to unmute again. Um, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I just, we transitioned, um, you know, from daycare into the pre-K-3 system, um, you know, and made a big deal out of a new teacher and Miss Belinda, and she's so great, we're at St. Francis, and, you know, so now we have a routine in the morning of the pre-recorded videos before, you know, we plug in to work, and, and so we have that established routine, and now starting on Monday, we're hearing we're going to get a whole new teacher, we haven't been assigned that yet. We don't know what the schedule is. And so, you know, it's going to, it's going to potentially change the routine for the kids. How do we support them with that? Knowing that, you know, they have an established routine that was already hard enough and, and now we're totally uprooting it again. Yeah, uh, that's, thank you, Katie. I think that's a, that's a great question. And I, I'm sure that's a lot of, you know, a lot of families sort of having the same experience. Uh, what I would say here is that um, I think there's a lot that we don't have control over and there's a lot of anxiety uh, for sure. So I think what you're doing uh, as you talk about it, I think what you're doing is it's great already for the kids. Um, just continue to build that. And I think part of it is, is to, to talk to them, you know, kind of have a, a honest conversation with them, telling them that, hey, there's going to be a, a new, might be a new, a new teacher. Right and and I don't know, you, you, you know, uh, your daughter, you know, how, how, kind of how does she think about it? You know, maybe there's something, maybe she's okay with it, maybe she's not okay with it. So I think you know, there's not a lot that we can do in terms of the overall situation, but there's a lot that uh, the family can do to kind of walk through the, the feelings. You know, as I talk about the emotion, right? How do you feel about it? You know, do you are you anxious? Now you have a new teacher. Are you scared that you have a new teacher, or are you you're so happy with your old teacher that you you are afraid that you're losing her? Like you know, you're not going to see her again. You know, so kind of like explore a little bit of different the feeling that she might have, and then let her know that you know it's okay, right? Like if she's just afraid that you know I'm not going to see Miss Ashley for a second right anymore, uh, we can say okay, it's okay. You know, Miss Ashley is always going to be in the library, so every time we stop by, we can still say hi. You know, you're not you're not losing her, you know, you just have an, a new teacher and that's, that's okay. You know, you, we always going to have new teachers. So trying to uh, engage with her in that aspect, I think is going to be very helpful on top of the, the routines that you already set it up. Uh, I hope that helps. Um, if I can add to just, I, cause I kind of have a little bit um, of what Sean is saying, but um, Katie, if you wanted to turn this transition into some type of um, bigger takeaway for you and your family, I always recommend making art out of something difficult. So for me, um, a suggestion if you wanted to turn this into, and for all of you who are kind of struggling finding the right way to open conversations that are honest with people that are smaller and probably can't articulate, you know, strong feelings. I like to think that this whole year for everybody has been different chapters, right? It's all been different segments of changes. And if you wanted to create, um, which I have shouted out in my, sorry, I think that's my mail. <laughs> I've shouted out in my um, literacy tips videos. If you wanted to um, create some type of story or storyline with your littles, um, just explaining, you know, what used to be. And how did you feel when that was what you had to do? Now, this is the new change. This is, a, this is a part of the story that changes and the expectations or what are your feelings here? And using the charts that Sean um, is included in his slides or other different um, familiar language you use in your family dynamic, I think one way to establish a routine and it can be difficult is allowing the child to have some accountability and ownership in the change. And by doing that, they're able to look at it as um, look at themselves as a character in their own story or look at you all as a family unit, as a, um, a team, right, against these challenges. So I think one creative place to start is talking to your child through story, um, what, life, what life changes have brought different feelings to your life. 
and what are the expectations moving forward? Because the rest of the year will be, and next year will be unpredictable. So I think one creative way um, so that your family doesn't feel too led astray is keep a storyline. Um, that's just something that I would recommend. I, again, before my doorbell rang, I was saying, um, I am hoping to launch a build a book series where we do kind of tackle social emotional concepts in um, story writing for kids with DIY projects at home. But that's one way where some of us who are struggling to um, finally have that balance with younger kids, but now the changes are happening again and you feel like, oh my goodness. Um, and I think a good way is to create a path for it so that moving forward as the child gets older, they can reflect on all the changes that they had to go through because that's what life is right now. So I hope that's a helpful literacy tip. Um, and thank you for asking that, Katie. I just was scrolling through my other, hold on. Uh, is there an Alicia here? Everybody should be able to unmute themselves now. I had a question from an Alicia. Alicia? I don't know, maybe she got lost or it was a technical difficulty. Um, any other questions for Sean or myself or for our children's department? Okay. Um, but yeah, while we're kind of wrapping this up, um, I also wanted to shout out a few other um, community organizations because Sean is also correct. Like you wanna involve yourself in as many organizations where you don't feel alone um, in these types of changes. Um, there is SPAN, which is the Parent Advocacy Network and they have tons of resources for different types of adjustments with all kinds of learners. There's also, um, I pronounce it NACI, which is the National Association of the Education of Young Children. And they all have um, a few other resources that talks about adjustments. I believe they also host um, a variety of different kinds of Zoom calls as well that you can also uh, take part of just to get different insights because everything will work differently for every other family. Um, and once again, everything Sean's mentioned, including his presentation, we will send to you. We're also recording this, um, this meeting so that you are able to access it later on or share with other friends or colleagues or people in your network. Um, we have a few other things at the library that could aid you in this time on the academic side, as well as other really fun um, events and activities that our youth services hosts on a weekly basis. Ashley, did you want to touch on that? Sure. Thanks, Jade. Um, we have a great um, database called BrainFuse. It's live tutoring every day from like 2 p.m. to, no, yeah, 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. Um, it's kind of more for the older kids. So if you have tweens, teens, um, high schoolers at home, even like college age, um, it gives great prep, great feedback. You can submit essays and get live tutoring notes back. Um, so that's BrainFuse and that is available through our website at hobokenlibrary.org. So that's a cool resource that we always love to shout out. Um, and then we have some great weekly programs, story times. If you have little, little ones at home, we are doing a virtual 1,000 books before kindergarten uh, program. Um, you can register for that at hobokenlibrary.org. Um, it's just, it, you just kind of get like badges and little prizes along the way. And it's just kind of good incentive and, and good reading tips to do at home. So that's something for the little, little ones. Um, and then if you're looking for stuff to do during the week, um, hopefully when you don't have school or other um, priorities going on, we have some story times on Zoom. Um, Valerie, Miss Valerie, my friend over there, um, makes some dope crafts to go. So if you guys uh, are local to Hoboken, um, she is making wonderful crafts to go so you can have something to do at home um, and also does weekly crafts on Zoom. Um, Valerie, anything you want to shout out? I mean, I just kind of shout it out for you, but you know, okay, she's good. <laughs> um, and then if you ever want to contact us, our email addresses are on the website. Um, and usually on every program listed on the events page. So if you ever want to shoot us an email, ask us a question, ask us to order something that you want. Um, we cannot stress enough that we are here for you guys and whatever you want, we want to be able to give to you. So never hesitate to ask us a question, shoot us an email. 
um, any of that. So I think that's it. Yes. Actually, yes, yeah. thank you. I want to um, echo that because I, I feel like with more conversations like this, we aim that this is one of, of, of maybe not too many, but a few, because we hope by this session and the more you're taking a day at a time that you feel a little bit more secure in all of the different things going on right now. But as a library community, we really ask that you all reach out to us um, to give us feedback um, directly on the type of programs or activities you think um, that would be useful um, in your family dynamic or in your learning community, because that's, that's why we're here. And we are really, really helpful that tonight was just a night full of different um, elements to share. Again, once again, we will be able to, um, oh, yes, thank you, um, Ashley. Um, we're really grateful that all of you were able to sit and absorb and share a little bit with us and take your time to um, get some of the assistance that we that you need. We hope that it was helpful and useful. Again, stay tuned. Um, a little bit after this, you will receive an email full of everything as mentioned above. Uh, we have a few moments if anybody would like to take any other questions. Um, if something hits you as soon as we end the call, again, reach out to us and we can pass the information to Sean if you had a direct um, conversation starter for him. Um, and in the meantime, um, the library is here for you. We're grateful. Um, and any final closing remarks? Everybody okay? Okay. Um, thank you all. Um, we are hopefully um, in a happier transition with the holiday season. And I know that can be a little hectic with the different changes, but also again, find a way to um, create, um, make this a, how would I put this? Make this a positively eventful chapter in your lives, regardless of all the things going on. So I encourage you again to thank you, Karen. Um, we appreciate that. Um, take this time to really reflect as a family so that um, things seem a little less scary and a little less challenging the more you go through it together. Um, thank you so much, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and close this meeting um, and we appreciate all of your participation. We hope to hear from you soon. Um, have a great night, everyone. Bye. Thank you.